The Los Lunas, New Mexico Museum of Heritage and Arts is hosting a truly groundbreaking exhibition featuring 64 artists whose works represent exceptional examples of both traditional and contemporary Hispanic folk art. This exhibition is exciting museum directors and curators throughout the Southwest, and many have asked for a detailed behind-the-scenes look at how this exhibition came to be. Today we have the opportunity to explore that question and several related ones with the curator of this exhibit, Nick Otero. Our aim is to provide you with detailed information that would help you to stage a similar exhibition in your venue, while also highlighting key considerations that you should make to achieve the level of excellence found in the current display. Nick is an accomplished artist and educator in his own right. When the idea for this exhibit was first suggested and approved, he began a multi-month long project to identify the most relevant artists and to encourage them to contribute some of their best work. So much of this coordination was Nick's responsibility. So let's welcome Nick Otero and begin. What was your vision when you first proposed this ex exhibition? 22 years ago, I fell in love with the traditional arts. And so this vision of developing this sort of an exhibition has been happening over time. And the idea was to be able to showcase the best of traditional and contemporary Hispanic artists working today. So once you had this vision, what were the first steps you took once the project had been approved? Well, once the project was approved, I knew I had to hit the ground running. So it was essential that I develop the list of artists and be able to have a database where I could keep files on each of them, research, if you will, things that they have achieved in their art careers. And so it was essential to have all of that information to inform just how this exhibit was going to happen. So you have the artists and your vision in mind, but there's a lot of logistics that are required. So how did you interface with the museum staff and with others to, to make this thing happen? It took a great deal of collaboration. There were many people involved in the process. And, and of course, it was a learning experience for many of us. So it was absolutely essential that that collaboration happened and that it was a healthy collaboration that could execute the vision of the show. How did you create the title? This, the title is really unique. Tell us about, a little bit about that. It's a good question. Well, when we were initially throwing the idea around for this exhibition, there were so many different titles that, that we could have used. But I think it was important for us to be able to have the idea of presenting the work that was done in the past, the work that's being done now, and the work in the future. So translating that into Spanish, ayer, hoy, y mañana, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, was, was a very good title. And, and it fit the theme of the show very well. So we've talked about the artists. There, there are hundreds of artists yeah. in, in doing this sort of work. Right. All of them very capable. Right. Um, how did you choose them? And what was your relationship with the artists? And, and how did you choose the ones that you wanted to ask to provide exhibition material? Well, you're absolutely right. And there's a lot of artists that are working in the traditional uh, art forms. You know, many of these artists are established. They have reputations uh, that they've built over the course of many years. And so quality was an absolutely essential uh, element that needed to be in there. There was many variables that went into the decision making of who was supposed to be or who could be featured in the exhibition. The idea was to also show the multi-generational aspect of the exhibition. So there are some newer artists that are included in the exhibition, but those newer artists are phenomenal in that they've just started, but the quality of their work is magnificent. And so this was also an opportunity to be able to show that. I understand you have some very young artists, including right. one that represents the third generation of these types of artists. Exactly. I mean, a lot of the artworks uh, that are in this exhibition um, are done by very capable hands, artists that have been working for years. But it's absolutely essential that we convey the idea that these traditions need to survive. They need to be passed on to 
younger generations. And so that was an important aspect of, of, the, of the show. We have a family, for example, that has uh, the grandfather, uh, his child, and his grandchild. So it was an absolutely um, important aspect. That's wonderful. So once you'd gone through this list that you'd compiled, including artists that you'd known for 22 years since you'd been right. involved, and newer artists and even very young artists, right. how did you choose, how did you actually select the 64 that we ended up with? And then once you selected them, how did you approach them to sell this idea to them? After all, this is a small museum in a small New Mexico town. Right. How did you choose those? Well, you know, there are many different traditional art forms. So that was just one of the variables that helped us decide who. Uh, for example, you have straw artists, you have tin artists, and, and, and all of that had to be taken into account as far as, as selecting the artists. In addition to that, one of the things that was absolutely important was to ensure that each of these artists had a background that, that showed quality, quality of work, and, and research, and people that actually know their art form in and out. Uh, so it was an essential to be able to, to pick those individuals and then to also have a personal conversation with them, to call them by phone, to express to them, you know, you're doing fantastic work. We would love to be able to show your work. We think you're part of this important story of tradition. And, and so that, that helped encourage many of them to participate. And of course, there were artists that are in the exhibition that have substantial reputations. So that also helped to usher in other artists to participate. This exhibit is both traditional and contemporary Hispanic folk art. Right. Could you, for those of us who are in the lay community, could you explain what the basic difference is between traditional and contemporary and, and how you chose to balance those in this exhibition? Well, balancing the traditional and contemporary uh, was absolutely uh, important. It was something that, that we needed to do uh, in showcasing all of the work. Now, you have the traditional artwork that's been going on for centuries. And of course, the artists that are working today are contemporary in what they're doing. Uh, but you also have those individuals who are stretching the boundaries. They're using the footing of that traditional art form and they're expanding into more contemporary expressions. So contemporary expressions meaning uh, political uh, themed works of art, uh, uh, commentary on social um, ills of our society and things that are happening in our contemporary culture. And we felt that it was important to include the two together because they can function together. For so long, uh, these two have been separated or segregated. You know, value was put more so on maybe contemporary versus traditional. Traditional may have been seen as something that was old and, and outdated. So our focus is really in this exhibition to showcase the two and to show the relevance and how both of those together make a much more powerful statement than just one. Um, one of the things I've noticed as mm -hmm. I've gone through the exhibit is the care which has obviously gone on in placement, in, in displaying the art. And, and, and I'm sure there were other ex important logistics things right. that you had to get help from the museum staff, the staff at the library who supports this museum, right. maybe the staff from the city, or maybe others. Right. Could you discuss these collaborations and, and how they helped and, and what was really important to make, be able to take your vision right. and your artist and bring this to fruition? Well, the initial collaboration began with just three of us, uh, me, Julie Castillo, and Travis Thompson. The three of us began to throw the idea around that we could produce a show like this and it was only when we uh, were accepted by the museum with our proposal that we were able to really collaborate and, and move forward with it. Uh, the staff of the museum and the director herself, they have a pulse on what needs to be done. Uh, they know the ins and outs. So it was a very healthy collaboration in that we could work together and to develop it. So knowing the floor plan, you know, the, the staff knows the floor plan. They have the architectural layout of the museum. Uh, those sorts of things were absolutely crucial 
in helping us to develop the exhibition and, and to move forward. A lot of collaboration. Um, this exhibit uh, in this relatively small uh, facility uh, must have required a tremendous amount of logistics support. I mean, you're bringing in wonderful pieces, statues and, and more contemporary pieces, but they've got to sit on something. They've got to be inside cases. They've got to be set in a particular way. So there must have been a tremendous collaboration with not only the museum staff, but others who could provide things like display cases or pedestals or special furniture. Could you talk about how that all came to be? Sure. I mean, the idea was to, to be able to collaborate with everyone. We all had an, an aesthetic. And so the challenge of bringing that all together was important. One of the things that was important for us to do was to bring in everybody, the staff, myself, all of those people that had been involved from the beginning and to sort of produce this layout, this virtual layout where I could photograph the pieces, illustrate the sizes. Uh, everybody could see in real time the colors that we were dealing with and how we could place certain things within the exhibition. So that took a lot of collaboration, you know, things like how are we going to display these pieces? You know, cases, those sorts of things involved us collaborating with local antique shops or other individuals who may have sewn fabrics together for presentation behind pieces. It was a massive collaborative effort. And so in developing the virtual um, presentation, we also got an idea of the pieces that were going to be shown. Great. That, that, that really, I think, that, that lends some credence to how this came to be, which right. was obviously a complicated operation. Right, and you have to understand too that the museum had an exhibition already in place. So it wasn't like we could take all of these pieces and start laying them out. There needed to be some sort of an avenue where we could take a look at what was coming in and try to figure out how it should look. And you obviously took full, uh, full uh, opportunity to use uh, digital capabilities to be able to manipulate it in, in, in virtual space yeah. so that you could make the thing happen before you actually started installing it. Absolutely. It, it, was, it was beneficial. You know, if, if I, for example, I'm an artist and I'm in my studio, um, the museum staff, obviously, they're, they're in their offices. They're doing other duties other than what's happening with this show. So from time to time, they had the capability to go on and again review it, make comments on, on where things could be and, and that sort of thing. So so, so just, just to help people sort of in a very concrete way, about how long did the planning process take and then how long did the actual installation take? The planning process was, was something that was ongoing. That took probably about a year because we had to figure things out like the calendar, uh, when to invite the artists, when would we... Uh, collect the works, all of that had to play into the schedule of what we were doing. And so that, that, that took place. Okay. And, and about how long, what, about how long to develop the sort of digital model? It was, it was rather quick. I mean, it was a process of uploading imagery, kind of looking, you know, and doing that. We didn't have the floor plan at that, at that point, but we had come in and, and photographed. Uh, we had the architectural plans, so we knew the limitations. Of, of what we had to do. So talking a, a year plus to actually from the time you sort of approve things till you finally got the exhibit in place. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the actual exhibit of this beautiful art, we've enhanced or you've enhanced the, the, the ex exhibition by having other activities. Could you describe some of them and, and what the impact has been? Well, one of the major components of this exhibition is obviously the educational aspect. And we felt that we could achieve that by producing two different panel discussions. The first panel discussion that we designed was in order to showcase female carvers that are working today, uh, a hugely overlooked um, category in the traditional arts, you know, uh, we wanted to highlight those women that are, are producing amazing work that are just as good, if not better, than their male counterparts. Uh, the second panel discussion that we developed was geared towards the younger artists that are working today, the future uh, generation that's, that's, that's producing work. 
And so those two panel discussions were absolutely pivotal to the exhibition. In addition to that, we also developed an educational outreach program where members of the community could come and they could learn about the different types of art forms that are being done. And that was guided by a lot of the, uh, by some of the artists in the exhibition. So I understand that some of the educational outreach was actually hands-on, where members of the public could come and try some of these various techniques themselves. Right. It was a very important educational uh, component of the exhibition. We were able to bring in four artists who demonstrated their craft. Uh, so, for example, we had ramilletes, which are paper flower adornments. We had a tin artist come in and demonstrate tin. We also had retablos. We also did uh, the fourth one, which was straw applique. And so the artists were able to come in and share their techniques and their tradition with the general public. And it was a hands-on workshop. And at the end of it, uh, individuals were allowed to take home a piece of work that they had created. Oh, what a great idea. Right. I think in addition to this video, which we're making for directors and curators, there was another video which you actually uh, did a guide, didn't you? Correct. We did a tour of the exhibition uh, using video. So we were able to present it in a virtual aspect as well. But another incredible thing that we were able to do was the actual book on the exhibition, which initially started as a pamphlet, but developed into this beautiful 125-page uh, uh, book that had color photos of the pieces that were in the exhibition as well as biographies on our featured artist. That's a, that's a great takeaway because obviously at some point the exhibition will close, right. but preserving this remarkable piece I think is an important part of any exhibition of this caliber. Right. Promoting this exhibit is a very important aspect of it. I mean, Los Lunas is a small town. Um, this is a small museum, and yet this has Real, this exhibit has real importance both locally and nationally. So talk to me a little bit about the, how you promoted the exhibit beyond just the local area. One of the things that I was able to do right away was to develop a Facebook page for the exhibition itself and to use social media to start promoting it. We worked hard to, to include uh, the local newspaper the Albuquerque Journal, for example, uh, and to do profiles on different on the different artists in the exhibition. One of the other things that we were able to do was actually bring in Good Day New Mexico, which is a TV outlet that we were able to use to to talk about the exhibition as well. To what degree were the museum staff and even the village and and the library staff? Uh, a part of that aspect of that process? Well, they were a significant part of that process because a lot of the funding came from the village of Las Lunas. You know, things like producing even the poster for the exhibition, the invitations for the panel discussion and the exhibition itself, that was all brought by, about by the village of Las Lunas. So in addition to print media and social media, right? Uh, did you use any of the local um, radio and, and uh, television outlets? We definitely utilized the, the, the television outlets. Uh, we were able to do a segment on the exhibition that was also promoted throughout the state. Um, so, c do you have any way of determining how effective your promotional activities were? My understanding is, for example, that the opening night was a standing room only. Right. Well, I, I think the numbers prove, you know, the effectiveness of, of, of that overall advertising campaign. I think the museum itself has seen record attendance. Uh, the opening night itself was a huge success in that we had lines out the door to get into the exhibition. And so I think the museum uh, had the foresight to see that this was going to be a, a big deal. You know, so the planning of even uh, having a giant tent outside of the museum itself in order to accommodate the big crowd was important. And I understand there was food and drinks for people who right. were waiting to come in. Well, the staff, at, the staff at the museum really prepared. I mean, there was even uh, table settings that were put at each table that were, were hand done by the individuals of the museum. Uh -huh. So the presentation was absolutely beautiful, and I think people really appreciated it. And it, it seems to me that, that critical to anything of this scale, 
uh, it, it has to involve a lot of people other than just the curation staff. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the fire marshal had to be consulted as far as how many people were allowed in the exhibition at any given time. And so there was collaboration with the local entities here in the village. And, and, and all of that was, was accommodated for. Wonderful. So in closing, Nick, um, what lessons have you personally learned that you believe other directors or exhibit coordinators or curators could benefit from it when they try to do an exhibit of this sort in their own venue? I think doing the research and, and knowing when things need to happen is important. And it's not always necessarily going to come from the individual that's organizing the exhibition. Uh, I think it's going to be coming from a variety of sources. Uh, for example, the museum itself, you know, what they have to contribute and how that affects the schedule of things is important. Uh, being aware of all the different variables, you know, for example, when the artist can bring their work, um, and also just maintaining a relationship with those artists and everybody involved is, is absolutely essential. It seems to me that, that the, the key words here that I hear you saying are collaboration, exactly. planning, and time. Time. Time is a big thing. Time is a big thing. This is not something that you right. want to rush. No, absolutely not. Well, Nick, thank you very much for your input. I'm sure this will be immensely valuable to the directors and curators who are trying to do something like this in the future, and we hope that it is useful to you, and thank you for watching.